Oh, now, you can probably laugh pretty hard. This is the p-value. <laughs> Late in the day. Uh, but, you know, the idea here is, are there statistically significant differences when you look at the numbers of patients? We had 32 moyamoya moya patients, 14 control patients. We compared them across the way, and we saw very nice differences. You're basically saying you could use a urine test to show that there was a difference between those that had moyamoya moya and those didn't. Is it possible, though, that this is clinically relevant? And again, this Harker's idea, if there's a statistically significant difference, but it's just a fraction of a percent, can you actually use that when you go see people, you know, like folks here? It, is it practical? And, um, you know, one thing that we found is that just by using a urine test, when you have the technicians blinded, run it through, and just go by the numbers, with just a urine test, you have a sensitivity of 87.5% and overall accuracy of 9 out of 10 times being able to predict which urine is from a patient with moya moya versus a patient that doesn't have it. It's not perfect, we've got a long way to go, and as anyone will tell you, this is not ready for prime time at all. So I don't want to oversell what we have here. This is an early preliminary work, but it's exciting that it suggests that it's a start. And really what this means is you have an appropriate cut point. And what a cut point is, basically the smart statistician company, it's the same thing you have in a pregnancy test, where if it's over a certain level, you could say, gee, this is somebody you might want to think about getting a scan on. I don't think this is something we can go out in the community and screen every kid in the pediatrician's office and say, gee, do you have moya moya or not? But maybe if you have groups of people that are selected, you say, well, gee, what about kids with Down syndrome that are tough to get in an MRI scanner? What about kids that have sickle cell disease? What about kids that might have, uh, you know, uh, uh, different types of neurofibromatosis or brain tumors? This might be something where you have a screening test that's less invasive that might point out kids at risk, and you saw some cases of that earlier. So I'm pretty excited about the idea of this as a screening test. I think another thing, though, is, well, how can we do anything better? In addition to just screening and finding things out, can we do therapies better? Can we treat people? And so we looked at the tumor folks, uh, my, my work with the tumor stuff for a little bit for guidance. Uh, we talked about early detection. You know, just to reiterate the point, with kids and with adults, you heard from both Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Scott that People present early and most commonly they present with a stroke or an ischemic problem. So you want to find out something early on. If we look at brain tumors, this is an example of a child with a brain tumor. You can see where the arrow is pointing this kind of brain tumor called a cranial pharyngioma. It was taken out. They thought that the child was all better. The um, child was getting regular follow-up was several years out from their surgery. thought everything was great. He was doing everything according to plan. And then what happened with this case, and this was our first case we published of this, was um, the child came in, normal checkup for like constipation, nothing to do with the brain tumor. And I had a colleague in the lab who was a GI doc and was looking at bowel stuff. And so collected some urine for what he thought was a control. And when he analyzed it, it was smoking. Oh, great, it's now done. Uh, and then carry the two, divide by three. And here, really, nothing to worry about. Uh, but when he analyzed the urine, what he saw was that there were huge numbers, huge amounts of this protein in there. He didn't expect that. And he said, well, gee, why is that the case? And we didn't know why. We looked back over the charts. We saw that years ago, the child had a brain tumor, this little girl. And the girl came in two months later, visual loss, bad headaches, got another scan, and the tumor had come back. And this is years later. And what we thought was, gosh, if only we had been smart enough at that time to recognize this as a warning sign. Maybe we could have gone in and found the scan before she had vision problems. And she ended up doing fine. Then when the tumor came out, the markers went away. So this is a great example of the possibility of early detection. Now, this is using tumor. Um, if we look further at this, if I can make this go now, uh, you know, the other question is, can you, if the problem goes away, do the markers go away? And this is an example here. It's another child with a tumor. We published this series here. You've got a brain tumor. The markers are there. You take the tumor out, the markers go away. Could you do something like this with Moya Moya? And you know, in these kind of findings, we translate it to these kind of <coughs> kids in Moya Moya. And so what we looked at now is we have a series of patients, and one of the questions is when they come in the office, you know, what kind of surgery should they get? How are they going to do down the road? Is the surgery going to work? And if you try to predict it just by looking at the Suzuki grade, the best we have now with X-rays, and you hold the X-rays up. And you say, well, if they have more severe Suzuki grade, you know, more severe disease, are they going to do worse or better in terms of their surgical response? And the answer is, we don't know. If you look at this, <laughs> if you have the really good outcomes, the fair outcomes, and the bad outcomes, the MRP angiograms beforehand don't predict that. So we don't have a crystal ball based on the x-rays to say who's going to do well and who do we need to watch a little more carefully. In contrast, 
if we look at their urine test when they walk in the door, so not at surgery, not afterwards, but day one before you make an incision, and then we look at them a year later, we pull those same urines out when they come back a year later for the angiogram, and we compare what their urines were before surgery with what their angiograms were a year later, we can clearly see a distinction based on these two markers, who does well and who doesn't. And so what this tells us is if we knew before surgery that patient X might not, patient Smith, might not do as well with surgery, then maybe you make a bigger operation. Maybe you scan them a little bit sooner. Maybe you change the medicine that they give. But these are things where you can talk to the family ahead of time and tailor your therapy. And so I think this is exciting because it suggests an additional application, not just the pie in the sky, can you find people with moya moya walking on the street by peeing in a cup. But once you know you have moya moya, can we tailor the therapy? Can we be smarter about how we do the surgery? Who's at risk? How we make the surgeries better? Um, and so I think this is really an exciting potential tool for urine here. The other thing, and the last thing I want to wrap up with here is, how can we make the therapy itself better? So separate from using a crystal ball to find out maybe who has moya moya, or using that crystal ball information to maybe help us treat the patients better, can we actually physically make the surgery better, you know, try to improve on what Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Scott have done? This is the surgery we do with children, so commonly the PLC and little cartoon, and basically we take a little blood vessel that's up in the top, it's laid down on the brain, as you saw in the operative pictures, and the goal is over time, what you want is that this donor vessel will build in new blood vessels and supply that new blood, basically creating a new piping system. If you have bad pipes inside, you put new good pipes from the outside. And so this is what you want to see after the surgery. You can see this is the normal piping system that exists, right, before surgery, and you're not getting much filling. And then this is from the surgical site. You can see this great filling over the side of the brain. So this is what you want to have happen. How do you make that happen reliably? And so one thing we've done is we now have an animal model of moya moya in rats. This is one of my texts, uh, you know, this poor rats getting surgery here. But what we do is we create a model of moya moya in these rats, and then we try to operate on them. One thing we found is that when the moya moya comes on gradually over time, as the ischemia gets worse, we can check the urine of these animals over time. And you can see, as the ischemia gets worse and worse, we can see that happening with our urine tests. So we can't do that in people. There's no ethical way, and even if there were, we weren't smart enough to say, well, if we had somebody that had moya moya, could you follow them over time and say, well, gee, when are they going to get sick? But we're able to do that now in animals. That allows us to study them in a way we can't do in people. And we're kind of excited about this. The hard part is making the rats pee. You've got to give them a lot of coffee. Now. <laughs> uh, but, but this is something that's very, very helpful, potentially, as a new way to discover the early stages of moya moya. And most exciting, we just started this, so I don't have a lot of numbers to show you, but one idea we've had is by adding growth factors, if we've taken these proteins out that are necessary for blood vessel growth, the idea would be to say, just like if that was fertilizer, at the time of surgery, whether it's a PLC angiosis like we do, or the combined approach like Dr. Steinberg does, could you sprinkle, and I'm oversimplifying things, but I'm just, you know, become a plumber here, but if you could sprinkle a little bit of extra uh, fertilizer on there, could you stimulate more growth? And so these are bits of brain from the rats, uh, and what we've done is both had moya moya, both were treated uh, for um, uh, the moya moya with surgery like we do normally, but one got the growth factor that we're choosing and one didn't. And the black dots are blood vessels. So what you can see is that we've got more blood vessels growing in the brain of the uh, rat that got the additional growth factor. So again, this is very, very early. This is sort of, uh, you know, preliminary, and I don't have any good numbers like the other ones, no good p-values <laughs> to, to talk about. But our hope is over the next year or so, um, you know, we're going to be able to, I hope if we are lucky enough to speak with you again next year, we can talk to you about a little more what the results are from this, and I, I hope this will be a way to make the surgery actually better and improve upon what we can do with our hands in the operating room. So uh, this is not just pie in the sky stuff. As I mentioned, we have, uh, for the tumors, we have a multi-center clinical trial uh, starting up this year uh, for the uh, Moya Moya. I think we're very excited about using these tools to tailor surgeries, to discover when people are at risk for Moya Moya, and then using that information to help to make us smarter and better doctors to make the results better. So this is something that, that we're pretty darn excited about. 
Um, this is the Boston Tea Party, a little local history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Texts and residents were very excited about this. Um, you know, in summary, I think uh, a lot of what we do for research is, is so important, uh, and I think it's groups like this that really drive the research forward. We're not going to get better. We're not going to make advances if it weren't for people like you that are willing to contribute your time. As Dr. Scott and Dr. Steinberg said, hearing follow-up from you, getting involved in raising awareness of this disease, pushing the scientific boundaries forward so we can be better about treating this in ways that we couldn't do five years, 10 years, 50 years ago You know when this was discovered. And the only thing that's going to happen is because of the great dedication of the folks here, of DJ with the website, raising awareness, uh, having people really contribute and participate in all the work that we're doing. Um, our hope is that from the most mundane but important stuff like databases to the most exciting stuff of uh, all the fancy pictures you saw of Dr. Steinberg's research out at Stanford, uh, my pictures aren't as exciting with the rat brains, but uh, uh, you know, these are ways that people are contributing to learning about this uh, disease and I, I really am very excited about the opportunity to try to push this forward. It's great to come here to hear what everybody's doing, the families, uh, Dr. Steinberg's work, Dr. Scott's stuff, uh, it's, it's just a, it's an exciting time to be involved in more and more research and I think there's a lot of good things we can do. Um, I want just to, you know, the, the marriage between the, the clinical and the scientific I think can't be overstated and I really want to acknowledge uh, not just, uh, you know, all the folks that have been so helpful here, uh, DJ and, and Sherry, but all my folks uh, back in Boston who have been just so supportive, uh, particularly Dr. Scott. None of this could have happened if he weren't willing to let the, uh, you know, one of his crazy new hires go play with urine and spend a lot of time in the lab. Uh, I'm very grateful to him for his mentorship, both clinically in the operating room and also uh, as, a, as a real role model for what I would hope to be someday as a surgeon and a scientist. So uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.